in the break, Elizabeth mentioned to me there was a good thing that I didn't say anything about what CFY was doing back then, seven or eight years ago, um, uh, when we first met, when she explained to me why this intervention in Romania was uh, not a, terrible meaning, a terribly meaningful one, because CFY has shifted to doing such different things today uh, relative to what it was doing back then. But I actually think this is instructive in uh, the nature of Elizabeth's work and the way she thinks about these problems in that you know, they're constantly experimenting, trying new ways of doing things, trying to figure out what worked well, what didn't, and updating and shifting their model accordingly. So um, without further ado, uh, Elizabeth will tell you about what she's currently thinking about in this. Okay, so good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, come on. You guys got to show some love up here. Okay, we'll try this again. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, and I know it's almost afternoon. Ooh, I think, yeah, one hour left. Um, so my name's Elizabeth Stock. I'm the CEO and co-founder of CFY. Um, we are a national education nonprofit. And as Ray was saying, uh, we have changed a lot over time. We've been around about 15 years, focused on ed tech throughout all of that time. And as the technology landscape has been changing, which it has been doing quite rapidly, uh, so have we. And just to give you a sense to sort of place everything, uh, we got started back in 1998, 1999. And back then, uh, internet access was dial-up. We did not have broadband back then. Um, Facebook didn't even, wasn't even in anyone's mind. Google was one year old. So as you can imagine, there's been a lot of change, and we've been changing along with it. So what I wanted to do in my talk today uh, was to uh, give you a little bit of background on what we're doing at CFY, and then I've organized my talk around four questions, because I thought that would be helpful for all of us. So uh, what CFY's work is, is we are uh, all about enabling students across the country to, har um, sorry, to meet the high learning standards, such as Common Core, to own their learning and to be college and career ready. And we have three strategic areas which are represented here. Um, in our first strategic area, uh, which is working directly with schools, and we do that in four regions of the country, in New York, Atlanta, the San Francisco Bay Area, and Los Angeles. We're basically doing deep whole school uh, implementations. Uh, we're doing blended learning in the classroom. We're working directly with principals, with teachers, and with parents, the four adults who have the biggest influence on learning. Um, and uh, we've been doing that for a number of years. So the second aspect of our strategic work is really taking the lessons that we're learning by doing this deep work with schools and in school communities and figuring out how to distill it so that we can spread it nationally. And we're taking both a top-down and a bottom-up approach to that kind of spread. And I'll talk more about that later. And then the last part of our work is really trying to play a role in figuring out what is quality digital content, like what really works. Is this product better than this product? And we've been doing a lot of work around random control trials, and I'll be sharing some more about that as well. So uh, as the last piece, we have a free K-12 learning platform called Power My Learning that we started developing a number of years ago and that we've gotten a lot of uh, the big national education foundations to support. And this free platform, Power My Learning, undergirds all three of our strategic areas. So we're using that platform in classrooms with teachers where we're doing professional development to help teachers improve their teaching practices. We use it with parents to help parents be more effective learning partners with their kids. And then obviously students are using it as well to do independent practice. Um, it also helps us with our national expansion. When you have a platform that's in the cloud, it helps you expand. And we're using that platform in the test bed that we, have that we're, we are availed of to do the random control trials. So these are some of the media coverage we've got and some of our funders. I know Robin Hood is in the room, and we're very uh, grateful for their support. So I won't go over them. They're just logos we see quickly. Um, and so now let's dig into some questions. So uh, these are the four questions I wanted to cover as part of my talk. So they are, what is the problem we are solving for? What is the optimal blended learning model? How can we achieve scale? And how can we improve the digital content being produced? So let's dig into the first question. So what is the problem we're solving for? So I've been to many uh, ed tech conferences where I will be sitting next to somebody who has a completely different philosophy and agenda than I have. Technology can be used to solve so many different problems. These are just three of them. 
So as an example, someone might say, look, education is too expensive. We have to be able to apply technology to bring the cost of education down. I've sat next to one of those people. There's other people who are like, I am here because I am from a rural district. We do not have teachers who can teach AP courses. We want to have AP course offerings in our district. We're going to use technology to make that work. I've sat next to those folks. And the work that we're doing is really around improving student outcomes, so this third piece. So how are students doing? Like, why are we trying to improve student outcomes? So this is giving you just a quick snapshot of the 2012 average scores of 15-year-olds coming from the PISA mathematics exam. And as you see, China, Shanghai had an average score of 613. Then Finland, Canada, and Poland were all very close to each other. Those are the first set of European countries after China, Shanghai. And then the United States is the 36th uh, ranked uh, education system. And we're at 481. But I also feel like averages sometimes hide a lot. So what we like to look at is the distribution. So here's what the distribution looks like. So what you see here is, you know, the United States is the, the looks like a pretty normal curve, distribution curve, but it's at the far left. Take a look at what China looks like, though. Like, this test probably wasn't hard enough for the Chinese students, right? They're still at the bottom part of their distribution curve. Um, but, you know, compared to the other European countries, they look pretty similar. And you can ask yourself, you know, if we see this kind of distribution across our country, is it also the same kind of distribution we see in the classroom? You know, and as Joel talked about before, the answer is yes. We see the same distribution even within a classroom, right? So you have students at all different parts of, in terms of their own uh, skill level. You can have a student that's at a third grade, students at a fourth, fifth. It can span a very large span. And teachers have to then handle that coming into the classroom. And what teachers are trying to do, their goal, is to try to squeeze that distribution curve to the right. Now, if you're going to do that, what you're basically trying to do is reduce the amount of variability and the outcomes, right? So as we push to the right, we're reducing that variability. Well, the only way to reduce the variability in the outcomes is to actually increase variability in the inputs. So that means that if students, if you can challenge every student just where they need to be challenged, then you can start to change those outcomes and push the distribution curve to the right. So the second question is, if that's true, we're trying to push the distribution curve to the right, technology should be able to help us with that. So that's exactly what I was thinking. And about three years ago, when we started to do work inside classrooms, and that was uh, thanks to the Robin Hood grant we got, that was the first question in my head, which is, OK, if we're trying to do that, push the distribution curve to the right, what then is the optimal blended learning model? And I then set about trying to figure that out. And we were doing some work with one school up in Washington Heights. We had a person on our staff who was working as an instructional consultant named Rob. And I was saying to Rob, Rob, what's the best, opt the best learning model, the best blended learning model? I said, look, you know, there's all these white papers coming out that are telling us all the different blended learning models. You can have station rotation, it could be lab rotation, it could be flipped classroom. Which one's best? And if it's, say, rotation stations, is it four stations or five? Is it three days a week, four days a week? Like, what is the best, the best option? And he said to me, you are asking the wrong question. It's like the question you are asking, the answer to that question is, it depends. And I said to Rob, we can't, as an organization, be building something with an it depends Respond, answer, like it, there has to be, if this is point A, I've seen those teachers that you're working with before you started working with, with them, there has to be point B that we are driving to. So what is point B? And I went back, is it three stations or four stations? He's like, no, no, I, I know this is really frustrating, Elizabeth, but you are asking the wrong question. So that is the wrong question, indeed. And so what we realized was that if it, that does depend, then we still need to have a good understanding as an organization of what point B is. And for us, we realized that the best way to do that was to actually build a construct. So we would be able to walk into any classroom, walk into any school community, and know how close are we to point B. Because it's not the number of rotation stations, the number of days. And so in order for us to build a construct, we set ourselves a very difficult task. We said, not only do we want to build a construct, but it has to be really simple, like E equals MC squared. Not quite that good, but as close as we can get. And it also has to hold all the way from K through 12th grade. Because another thing I had noticed going to these ed tech conferences is you'd have somebody on a panel making a big pronouncement, but then when you'd say, well, does that work for kindergarten students? No, 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 I'm talking about high school students. Or someone else would say, it should be this. And we'd say, are you talking about high schools? No, 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 I'm talking about the early grades. So we wanted to build a construct that would hold for all kids K through 12. And then this is what we came up with. 
we want it simple, two gears, they're interlocked, right? The left gear is one that you guys probably have all seen many times, which is basically the instructional learning cycle, right? So it's personalized instruction. You want to implement data-driven instruction. This left gear can be driven by either parents or by teachers. If a teacher is driving this gear, it would look something like I take some data, maybe from an exit ticket, maybe from formative assessment or summative assessment. I then am doing my planning. I might start my lesson with whole group instruction. I might do some guided practice. I might have the students do some individual practice. I collect data again. I go around the cycle. So we picked a gear because it, it expresses the cycle. And then there's also the right gear, which we call student-driven learning. Student-driven learning is also a cycle. That's how we learn how to walk, right? We, when we're little tiny things, we take a step and we fall down. That's the data. We then go and say, all right, I'm going to take another step. Fell down again, new data. And we're using the data and going around in a circle. There are fewer steps, but it's the same idea of a cycle. And for us, the whole point of this was that you needed both of these gears to be operating and they needed to be interlocked. And that that's where you'd get the biggest ROI. So in terms of holding K through 12, we felt like this held because in the early years, you'd expect the personalized instruction cycle gear to be more prominent. Teachers and parents are playing a bigger role. And then as students get uh, closer to graduation and their 11th, 12th uh, graders, you would want the student-driven learning cycle now to be far more prominent, right? Because if a student graduates from high school, even if they've gotten stellar test scores, but they've never done any of that learning on their own, it's always been scaffolded or it's always been taught by a teacher in some fashion, when they go off to college, they're gonna have a heck of a time. So we wanted to make sure we were getting those skills instilled in kids early on. Now for us, where does the algorithm fit in with all of this? We actually see the algorithm, uh, we see technology as being a huge support on both sides of the cycle, but in our case, the algorithm is also scaffolding. Right? So if a student is struggling and algorithms move them down to a different level and they're then learning, that's great. That is really, really helpful. But eventually you need students to be able to do that for themselves. So it's again, it's scaffolding that should eventually come away because when I hire someone as an employee and they're struggling, I don't have adaptive software to give them to help them. So that's the way we built our construct. And this construct has applied, or we've looked at this in terms of everything we do at our organization, in terms of the work we're doing in the classroom, and in terms of how we've built our platform, Power My Learning. In terms of how it works in the classroom, one of the things we've seen is that teachers are often reticent to focus on the student-driven learning cycle. They feel like, look, I can actually get really good gains as measured by the state tests without that, so I don't want to spend time on that. And one of the things that's been really helpful is with Common Core rolling out, it actually gave, gives us an opportunity to focus there because students can't do the deeper understanding and do the application without it. So now teachers are excited about it and are interested in helping their students and supporting them with student-driven learning. Just as one last piece of how these two differ, um, if a student is given an assignment by their teacher and they go and they do that assignment, even if it's homework, we still view that as part of the personalized instruction cycle because it was assigned by an adult. It's when the student says, you know what? I did not understand this at all in class. I could do the homework, as I've been told, but I will do terribly on it. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump on Power My Learning and try to understand what I'm missing. Like, why is it when I multiply a negative by a negative, I'm getting this and not that? So we wanna see students be able to do self-remediation. That wasn't assigned by their teacher. That's in the student-driven learning cycle. We also want to see a student who comes home and says, you know, this stuff is super easy for me. Like, I totally get it. Oops, I went ahead one. I totally get it. That they can then jump onto a platform and be able to do enrichment. They can learn more about it. And if they go and do enrichment that wasn't assigned, we call that the student-driven learning cycle. So that to us is how the two interlock. So with our taking this construct and trying to apply it, how are we doing? Well, with our first strategic area, where we're doing deep work with schools and helping change teacher practices, this is what we saw uh, from our seven research schools last year. So seven of our schools were in our little research study. And what we did, this is all public information. Anyone can go crunch this data, and they'll get the same exact outcome. What we did is you see the, to orient you, along the y-axis is the percentile ranking. So we're looking at how, uh, how this, they did in terms of the state math ranking for their state. And then across the bottom are, are seven schools. And these are hailing from uh, all four of our regions. And so what you see is in 2011, 2012, prior to working with schools, 
Uh, you can see where they were ranked. Most of our schools were definitely in the bottom 10th percentile in their state. They weren't performing well. They had good performance. We had one that was a high performer. That's a charter school out in East Palo Alto. All of these schools are serving at least 75% of the kids are free and reduced lunch. And then uh, the 2012-13 year, the year we worked with the school, their state rankings popped up to that. And it gives us an average of 10 percentile point increase. So then if we're seeing look, what looks like to be promising evidence that we're having an impact. The question is, how do you scale? So that's my next question. How do we achieve scale? And for us, we're looking at both top-down and bottom-up scale. Now, if you're talking about bottom-up scale, the only way that can happen is if teachers adopt on their own. So if you create an intervention, technology intervention or otherwise, that a teacher needs to go to their principal to change the block scheduling or to add another teacher in their classroom or any other big changes in the school structure, then you're talking top down. But if you can build something that teachers can adopt on their own within the environments and the constraints that they're already in, you can now have some bottom up growth. And so that's one of the ones we are focusing on first. Um, and so what do we know about teachers? If teachers are gonna be the ones who are gonna adopt and grow what we're doing, what do they say? So what we see here is a recent survey just came out from the Gates Foundation. They surveyed 3,100 teachers. And what teachers said was, first of all, they recognized the value of technology tools. Back in 1999, when we started at CFY, that was not true. So this is new, okay? I think it's because the teaching profession has shifted, the pressures have shifted, but there's demand. So we can't say there's not demand. The next thing is that teachers want choice. Teachers were 30% more likely to call products effective if they had a say in choosing them. And the next thing is that teachers want strong common core alignment and they want granularity. And I picked a quote here that was from this, the uh, report where this is a quote from a teacher who said, the biggest improvement would be for the content to be broken down by common core standard so teachers can easily see which activities correspond to which lessons while they are planning. So why the granularity? Like why is the granularity so important? And for us, the reason why we feel we're seeing that point is because Going back to the distribution curve, I'm a teacher, suppose I'm a sixth grade or seventh grade math teacher, and I'm trying to teach a particular common core standard tomorrow. Like, I'm not the one who's going and picking whether I'm using this textbook or that or this software package or that. That's, you know, someone at a higher level than I am. I'm trying to teach a vast a range of students the concept that I need to teach, and I'm gonna go look for materials. And the way teachers wanna look for them is in that granular fashion. So then the last thing is that they found that teachers find free products just as useful as products purchased by their school or district. So how is Power My Learning doing in terms of this viral growth? What do we see with Power My Learning? Well, the first thing is Power My Learning is free. What Power My, this is a picture of our platform. What we do at Power My Learning with Power My Learning is we are basically identifying the best free and freemium content that exists online and we're then tagging it by the common st core standards and we're doing all the taxonomy work. The types of activities that we're selecting could be games, videos, they could be uh, um, simulations, they could be interactive, so it's a vast array of different types of content. And we're doing the selection in this very granularized way. So in other words, there's a pretty good site called Starfall that some of you may have heard about, which is free. It has really good uh, literacy activities for uh, kids in the early years. So we don't create one of these little uh, uh, tiles that goes right to Starfall, we go dig around Starfall's site and we might pull 20 tiles, each one pointing to a different place on that site that, will, that aligns to a particular common core standard. So what you see here is each of these tiles, again, is one of these activities. We purposely spend time thinking about the picture or the thumbnail because we want to make them really engaging. The kids will want to go and do enrichment on their own and they'll click through and find things. We then give the title and then we then give the publisher. Because we're doing free and freemium content, we have over 800 publishers already on the site and it's growing constantly. Along the left side, what you see is our search and navigation. So if a teacher wants to search for content, they can. So let's go back to the what teachers want piece. So can it, how does a teacher then, it's granular, how can they find what they need tomorrow? So if I'm a seventh grade teacher teaching a common core standard, but I have kids that are in sixth grade, are at the sixth grade level, seventh grade level, and an eighth grade level, I can expand that grade band to the levels I need. I can then go into uh, CFY's common core flyout, which is basically like if I click on math 
Out comes the common core domains that are related to the um, grade bands I've selected. I then come over here, I can see this, the clusters, and then from the cluster I can get to the standard. I can click on see results and then the whole, all the content filters just to that standard. So basically, it's responding very directly to what that one teacher's quote uh, was saying. So how, does that, how has that helped us in terms of growth? So I think in part because we've built the platform responding to these needs that you're hearing from the Gates Foundation. We actually built it before the Gates Foundation report came out. It's because we've been doing all this work in the classroom, so none of those things were very surprising to us. What we've been seeing is the following. So this is now a chart of the growth in schools with registered users by month. Uh, you have the month along the x-axis and then the schools. And what you're seeing is very quick uptick in growth. Um, so I want to share another thing with you because uh, I think this is a pretty interesting question, which is we've been talking about how you do spread across schools. Like how do you get more and more schools using, uh, or doing, using a product or doing blended learning? But the other question is within a school, how does something spread? So who is the viral agent inside a school building with a platform similar, like, so similar to ours? So I have a picture here of a viral agent in one of our schools. And I want to ask you guys, who is this? Is this the principal? Is this a gen ed teacher? Is it the science teacher? Who do you think inside a school building actually ends up playing that role? Anyone want to guess? Who is this woman? She's not, the, she's not in the cafeteria, I'll tell you that. Anyone want to guess? No, you guys are quiet. Nope. Nope. This is the special ed teacher. So why would the special ed teacher end up playing this role? Because by law, special ed teachers have to differentiate their instruction. So Miss Wright, who you see a picture of here, she immediately, she does not even like technology. She describes it as technology and I were not friends. She immediately grabbed Power My Learning and was like, oh my god, I could build the IEPs in here. And then I don't have to carry around like this huge amount of resources for all my kids. So she grabbed it right away, started using it. But why else is she so powerful? Because she's pushing in. Right? So she's going into other teachers' classrooms and watching what they're doing, and then afterwards going, hey, by the way, let me show you something really cool that'll make your life so much easier or help you differentiate your instruction better. So I just thought that that was very interesting because I definitely would not have known who she was. If you'd shown me this picture before we started doing this work, I would not have known that was a special ed teacher either. So then the top-down change, just really quickly, we've been seeing a lot of districts very interested in our work and coming to us and wanting to integrate their platforms with ours and having us do professional development with them. So these are, this is just a quick list of some of the ones that have come to us so far. Uh, we have, like I think, a backlog of another 25 districts that are coming on soon. So we're also seeing some top-down change as well. And then finally, the last question, and this is a slight pivot from the other things we were talking about, which is how can we improve the digital content being produced? Well, first is the question, like, you know, do we need to? I mean, what's going on in the marketplace for digital content? And so at my organization, over the last, say, four or five years, we've attracted a lot of folks coming to us from for-profit publishers. And so it's me, and who, I actually never worked in the for-profit sector, not to say that's a badge of honor, it's just the way my trajectory was, but I'm surrounded by all these folks who all come from for-profit companies and have come to CFY. And one of the things we've seen in terms of the marketplace is that it's very much broken in terms of what we see for content development. There's four big players, the four big publishers, and then there's all these small companies at the bottom. There's a lot of venture capital that's going in, and the idea for those companies as their exit strategy is they sell to one of the top big four. One of those guys will sometimes buy them just to kill them so they don't have competition. And the thing that we noticed the most, though, that was problematic in the market and was sort of setting up this uh, setup was that there's no, nobody can tell what works better than, you know, does A work better than B? And if you can't tell that, and you are running a really large publisher, and you're trying to bring about shareholder value, improve shareholder value, then what you want to do is you want to build a new product to maybe a B minus level. You don't need to build it any better than that, because nobody can tell if it's any good. And then you're going to sell, 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 sell. Like there's no reason, there's nothing in the marketplace to tell you to do otherwise. So our feeling was, if we could actually change the way the market works and make it so that folks could see which products work better than other products, it's gonna force everybody to raise their game and to build much better product. It might also mean that I won't get as many great for-profit people coming to me, but that's okay. And so that was something we decided to set out to do. It's farther upstream from our other work, but we feel is very important and very impactful. 
So um, how do we do that? Well, we've built these things called quiz packs into Power My Learning. Um, and a teacher can put them in their playlist. As I was showing you before, there are all those tiles. I didn't want to give you a whole the thing about the platform, but you can, teachers can then uh, put them into playlists and assign them to students or use our playlists and modify them. So a teacher can easily pop a, qu a quiz pack into a playlist they've generated or a playlist that we've uh, created that they are using. And then what the playlist does is when the student goes and clicks on the playlist, it randomly assigns them to one of these three pathways. They're either in treatment A, treatment B, or the control. And the difference is, for treatment A, they get a pre-quiz, then digital learning activity A, then post-quiz. Treatment B, pre-quiz, digital learning activity B, post-quiz. Control, pre-quiz, post-quiz. And you're like, well, why do you need the digital learning activity? The only reason why we have it there is to make it so that all the students have the same duration of time that they're in the quiz back. So you don't have a group of kids who are like, teacher, I'm done. Give me something to do. Ugh. Right, so we wanted to make sure that the length of time was the same. So we uh, put this out into the field in uh, the fall. We tested a bunch of different pieces of content against each other. The big question for us was, would we see anything that was statistically significant? Did we have enough statistical power? And just to add one other thing, there are things that we're also not doing here. So what are we not doing? We're not testing full courses here. We're testing granular content, although you know, full courses are made up of granular content. Another thing we're not doing, we're not testing retention. So a student might do well on a post-test, or post quiz after doing a digital learning activity, we're not coming back to them two or three weeks later to see if they've retained it. That's really important work that needs to be done. But our feeling is you would only want to do that work if you know that there were any gains to begin with. So we're doing the first step of that. But I just want to be clear because a lot of times in the research world they get asked, but you're not testing retention. So I just want to be clear what we're doing. And so what we saw was really interesting. We actually saw that we were able to build a research model where we did see statistically significant results. In one case, in one of our experiments, we saw that one product or one piece of content did do better than another and was statistically significant. In another case, we saw that the product, one of the products, was actually really confusing. And so the kids in the control did better than the kids who did that product. So they understood it better on the pre-quiz than they did on the post-quiz. So I think, for me, what's really interesting about this is we as an organization came at this question from let's test product against product because that'll be super helpful for the market. But now I've also come to realize we're learning a lot about learning by doing this testing. Like why was that little digital learning activity, why was that confusing? What made kids find that difficult to then basically unlearn things that they learned new before? So with that, um, we are going to be doing more work to build out the random control trials and to make them automated. But other than that, I'd love to take questions. Don't be shy. Hi. Um, so I wanted to know how you're sharing what you learn about these granular lessons. Um, are you sharing that information directly with teachers? Are you grading resources? on your site, like how do you do that without angering a whole lot of people? <laughs> Good question. Um, we are not yet at the point where we're ready to share. Like what we were trying to do with this first round was to see whether we could see anything at statistical significance, which we were excited that we could, but we want to make some modifications to the research design and we're going to go out this coming fall to, do, to test those modifications. Then the other thing we need to be able to do is to automate things. So as an example, you know, students who took those, this quiz pack we then had to take the back-end data, and we have a partnership with SRI, where a researcher there had to like slot it into his schedule and do all the data crunching and come back and give us the analysis. Once we have our final uh, research design, we can automate that. And so then we'll be able to do them really quickly. And then the last thing is, we also are in this weird place right now as a country where this question of like what works better than something else, in a sense, has to be done with common core assessments. And the Common Core assessments haven't really rolled out yet. So we were using, as this first round, we were using MWEA items. But eventually, we want to be able to use the Common Core assessments, and we're a little too early. So the timing works well for us in the sense that we can be building and testing and refining. And then when the Common Core assessments roll out, we can pop those in and then run. But because of that, we're not really ready to share, you know, because we're using different older items. People are, you know, if Bob made a product and Sarah made a product and we come out and say, Bob's product's better than Sarah's, Sarah's going to, wait a minute, this is, you don't know if it's better with common core assessments, so we're just waiting until we have all the pieces plugged in before we go out and start sharing all the information we're collecting. Other questions? Hello. 
Thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that viral agent concept? How did you figure out who she was and what are you doing with that information? Oh, um, let's see. How did we figure it out? We actually figured it out because we were, uh, you know, we have a, our model works such that we have an instructional consultant who's on my staff who's in the school building at least once a week. And so this was Rob back in the days of Rob. So Rob was noticing that Miss Wright had really gotten very interested in the platform. And I think in part because she was not a technology person, she wasn't seeking a technology solution, she then became more of an evangelist uh, than I think someone who already is looking for technology. And I think the only way it doesn't work is if that teacher is not well respected by their peers. In the case of Miss Wright, she's extremely well respected by her peers. And we just started hearing these stories from her of like, you know, I was in the ELA classroom and I noticed that Mr. Johnson was doing it this way and I went up and we're like, that's professional development. And she's like, no, it's not. I'm just helping a colleague. You know, and then I, I can't remember which meeting I was in. I was probably with a funder where I, Ms. Wright was in the room and I described her as the viral agent. She got very upset and said, I am not spreading disease. Uh. I am spreading the love. I said, okay, you're spreading the love, but people understand it as a viral agent. So, um, so I think what we've been doing is just sharing that information as broadly as we can. We actually gave a briefing to Jim Shelton down at the U.S. Department of Ed, and it was probably the one thing he was most interested in. He said, oh my God, that's so interesting. I've never thought of the special ed teachers as being so important to, to change within a school building. So. And so did you build out any functionality related to IEPs or special ed, or is that just something no, it's you already continue in. to observe? Oh, it's already it's in. I mean, Ms. Wright was already using all of that. But what we have done and we're doing more of is we've built a lot more functionality around teacher sharing. Mm -hmm. So teachers can build playlists and share with their colleagues, yep. and we're now going to be allowing teachers to follow each other. Because my whole dream is this one of, you know, I was a school teacher but a long time ago. There's this idea that, like, you know, I'm on Power My Learning, and I see there's this guy named Jed, and he lives in Oregon, which is really far away. But that guy thinks like me. Like, he keeps building playlists the exact same way I would do it. I'm following him. And every time he does a playlist, I want to see it. And then my, maybe I'll start taking Jed's playlists and modify them myself, send them back to Jed, and the two of us can then start to build. Yeah. Right? Great. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I think I noticed on the graph that one of the schools had actually taken a step backwards, and mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you guys were able to do the research to figure out what exactly happened there and if you've been able to address it. Yeah, no, that's a good question. So um, that's definitely true. That was the year that we were doing this was the year that the Common Core rolled out. So between the two bars was the Common Core assessments rolling out. That was a school that was in New York State. So there's basically two answers. One is that um, New York, when the Common Core rolled out, it had a disproportionate impact on ELL students. That school had a very large percentage of ELL students. That's one reason why. But the second reason why is also because, you know, in that school, the leadership is not as strong. Like that school principal does not play the role of an instructional, um, you know, they, she doesn't, she's not an instructional leader within the school building. So one of the things we've learned from that experience is how to be more selective when we're choosing schools to work with you know, there's a, like, it's the same as when you're recruiting for anything else. You can ask somebody, hey, are you good at this? Like, oh, I'm really good at that, right? But you have to say, well, what was your experience in the past that would show me that you're good at it? So we ask principals now a lot of questions around how they manage change and how they drive change. Because if a principal is, like, afraid of conflict, they are not going to be very good at driving change in their school building. So that was some of the things that we learned from that. We're expecting that to go up. We're still with that school this year, and we, we're quite sure that that's going to go up this year. Thanks. And just as one quick follow-up, do you, do you know the average penetration you have in the schools that you're working with of teachers that use it? Uh, in the schools that we're doing the deep work with, we're, we're doing all the, we're focusing on math right now, but it's bleeding into the other subjects because the platform is free and has content in all subject areas and all through K through 12. But within the math, uh, teachers, it's 100%. Um, in the schools that are not our schools, like the ones that are just finding it and going viral, I would say that um, in a lot of cases, there will be one teacher in the school that might be using it, and then other teachers wait and watch and see whether that teacher has success, and then they start to use it. So it, it's, some, it's not as much penetration and when teachers are finding it, and it's more of a viral spread. So if I can relate this back to something that Joel Rose said, um, it seems like you are, to some degree, providing a product to teachers as opposed to trying to reorganize their classrooms. Um, 
But is there some classroom reorganization component to this, A, and B, yeah. if there isn't, uh, and if you could have your way, how do you think you would reorganize a class with this component infused no. in it? You know, that's a great question. So um, we are very interested in not just classroom reorganization, but school-wide change. And what we've been tracking internally is how the work we're doing with teachers, because we're focusing at that level, is starting to percolate up and make the schools think about other changes. So a good example is we have, we've been working with the school out in East Palo Alto, um, and we're planning to work with them again next year. And the principal said to us, you know, I really am thinking that I should change the schedule around because we, we're not, there's not enough time to really do good work in the rotation stations. So I want to move us next year to block scheduling. So we've seen that. We've also seen when a teacher leaves and the principal is rehiring, that they think differently about what they're looking for and how to do the rehiring. So we're trying to keep track of all of that because the question is, can you have sort of a ground up change in systems? And the second thing is we're also interested in the more direct change. So as an example, uh, the Gates Foundation and, so, and uh, Educause both do these RFPs for new school design. You know, we've been partnered in with other groups that are doing new school design. And actually one thing I think that's interesting just from a trend perspective is I had a call with Andy Kalkin who runs Educause and they're sort of doing the big RFP around this. And he said to me, he's like, the first time ever, he's like, we've done a whole bunch of RFPs, this is the first time that every single person that responded to RFP, every school leader, said they were gonna do playlists. So playlists is really taking off. And to me, playlists has to do with choice. Like, it's about grabbing different things from different publishers. So I think that that's a very interesting trend that's happening within the sector. But yeah, we're interested in that too. We just think of that as very slow to scale. So we're trying to do both at once. The other benefit actually of the top-down approach is you create really good proof points. Like you create things that people can go and see. It's the point B. Like, okay, great, so I have this great tool, but what can I really do with it? Well, you know, you can go see one of these schools or take a video of what's happening in those schools and then people go, oh, that's so cool, I can do that. That's what I'm gonna drive toward. So I think that showcase schools or proof points are also very valuable. Um. Just a quick question about the, kind of the long-term vision. Uh, it's a free product. It's gotten tremendous support from really great institutions. Um, so what's your plan in terms of sort of sustaining it as an as a existing product in 10 years or 15 years? So that's a great question. Um, we don't want to be fully dependent on philanthropy for that product for the rest of our future um, for a variety of reasons. And so we've been doing a lot of thinking about whether there's pieces of what we're doing or new features that we could build in that we could have fees for. But what we've promised our users and um, funders and, and ourselves is that what is on the platform now that's free, we will never charge for. Because all of us, like almost all of us use LinkedIn and we were pissed when they did that to us. When they're like, everything's free. Oh, by the way, not anymore. You're like, wait a minute. It's sort of like it's because I joined that this thing has value. So we want to make sure that what's there now is always free. And there's a lot of thing, ideas we have about like back-end analytics and doing things at the administrative level. We're doing a lot of thinking now around how we can build professional development into the platform, um, similar to what we were hearing before that Ellen was doing. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>